I'd like to thank everybody for being here today. Welcome back to our second recording of the Art and Garden Lecture Series. We're so glad to have you with us. Today we have Miss Carol Reese with UT Extension. She is the Horticulture Extension Specialist for the Western Region, and she'll be sharing with us her talk on the birds and the bees. So we are literally going to have the talk with Miss Carol today. So um, enjoy the talk, everyone. Also, I'd like to apologize. I forgot to hit the record button when Carol first began her talk, so we've missed the first few slides, but we're just gonna jump right in there and uh, pick up where, where we left off. Plants, they've got pollen on them. Hopefully they're bringing plants, uh, bringing pollen in from other plants. But as they go on back to get the sweet stuff down at the base of this style, then they're going to brush up against those other, the stamens there that are bristling with pollen. And when they leave, they'll be carrying that to another plant, hopefully. Then other ones will do this. <clears throat> the style itself is completely separate from the stamens. It doesn't come out from the very same structure. But again, jut it out in the front. Um, and we're going to look at some of these plants, but that female part is active sometimes, and then the male part is active at other times so that that keeps them from pollinating themselves. So let's remember how this happens, right? The pollen lands on the tip of that sticky stigma and then it actually germinates and it grows down through the style into the ovary. You know, it's like, remember the fruit of the womb? That is where the pollination will take place and that baby will grow in that roundy moundy womb that you find on female plants or flowers that have both male and female parts as this one does. And anthers, look at those, isn't that interesting? That an anther stands up and releases pollen when it's tickled just right. That's a little bit of a risque analogy to what happens in the human world too, right? Uh, so let's, that's enough of that. But let's, let's review this real quick because this is gonna come into how plants keep from doing this in-crossing. Uh, dioecious plants, we have got a boy plant, we got a girl plant. They gotta get close enough together to make babies. Then we have plants that have flowers that are bisexual or hermaphroditic, and that flower has all the parts it needs, both male and female. On monoecious plants, we have male and female flowers on the same plant, but they are actually separate flowers. We're gonna look at examples of this. We're very common, these are very common, and most of us who garden know we can look at our squash flowers and we can tell the, the male flower from the female flower, because look, there's that womb, there's the fruit of our womb. We could cut that flower open and look at those parts. The spice bush is another one that we could look at easily. Let's look at one of the true monoecious, and that would be our pecan, and oaks do the very same thing. The male flowers, which are forming right about now, very soon, are these catkins that will fall off once they've done their thing, release the uh, pollen grains. And then the female flowers just look like little tiny pecans, they look like little tiny acorns. And of course, once they're pollinated, they will stay on that tree and develop hopefully into the seeds. Um, but the way pecans avoid self-pollination is there are some that are called androgynous, and that means that the male flower blooms first and its female flowers are not blooming. Then another pecan tree is gonna be gynecious, and its female parts are blooming before its male parts. That way, they will not self-pollinate, but you have to know that if you want pecans because you need a gynecious type pecan next to an androgynous type pecan because you need a male pecan tree parts blooming at the same time as the female pecan tree. So that's why you have like these two columns of pecans that you have to have to have self-pollinating. So it's real important for, to know these things for plant production or for, uh, you know, having berries if you love hollies. So, Gender in plants is a very important. I always wanted to start a nursery called Gender Issues and specialize in plants that you had to know about the gender, which ones to avoid, which ones to get together. Spice bush is one of those. And of course we love our spice bushes. They're late winter bloomers. Uh, male and female have to get together to make the red berries that make the spice. Also a great plant for our butterflies, the spice bush swallowtail with the world's cutest caterpillar. Other flowers have really weird strategies. Our native jewelweed, Impatiens capensis. Um, it blooms in late summer as the hummingbirds are starting to head south. It is timed exactly to to, for that migration on purpose because it is exactly adapted to a, fit a hummingbird's head. 
he jams his head in there and that little cap, the capensis part of it, taps him on the head. He's got to stick his tongue all the way back around that curved cornucopia to get to the sweet stuff. But this flower starts its life out as a male flower. There he is poking his head in there. By the way, this sugar, the sugar content of this flower is 43% sugar. And they're fattening up as they are going south for their migratory push. So, uh, by the way, and I do a strong hummingbird solution. I won't go into that, but y'all can link it to my uh, wildlife publication that I'm going to talk about here in a little bit. Well, if you look closely at a, at a jewelweed flower, you see there are the little male parts right there that are tapping the hummingbird on the head as he's going around getting that 43% sugar. But if you look at another one, you might see that there, there's a close-up of the little male parts right there and, and him putting his head all the way down there. Another one, wait, that doesn't look the same, does it? And yet, usually when you have male and female flowers on the same plant, they look very different. So why does this one look the very same? Well, the reason is because this flower starts out its life as a male, but the female parts are developing behind the male parts. And eventually they push the male parts right off and they fall and the flower is suddenly a female flower. So for days it had been delivering pollen, now it is ready to receive pollen. So those are the female parts that are gonna become the seed and then eventually those fun little seeds that when you touch that just explode everywhere. So it's a, it's a, a transsexual flower. It actually changes gender during its lifetime. And there are many flowers that do that actually. And y'all know my hummingbirds are my passion. I love my hummingbirds. I have had them now here for about 10 days. <clears throat> Let's talk about pawpaw, another great plant out in our wild, out in our woods. Usually when you see flowers of this particular kind of color, it's gonna have a really strange scent. They're a color of raw dead meat, right? Carrion flower. And they often smell like um, dead meat or even carrion to attract their pollinators, which aren't going to be bees, they're going to be your flies and beetles. So that's kind of an interesting thing to know. Uh, I don't find that pawpaw flowers smell like dead meat though. To me they smell a little bit yeasty. They're, they're kind of interesting. And there's our flies attracted to them. That's why you need to have two separate seed-grown pawpaws fairly close together to get fruit. They cannot be a big colony of the one plant like you often find in the woods. Uh, flies and beetles don't fly very far. Honeybees will travel, travel miles. So you have to have two separate individuals close by to get pollination to get the big fruit, the largest fruit in North America. Cool plant. Um, I always associate it with the Lewis and Clark ex expedition because the very knowledgeable um, Native American Sacagawea was the one who taught them to eat this fruit. Um, they were very short on carbohydrates. They were still killing plenty of meat. They weren't starving to death, but they didn't know what they could eat in the wild. And she was the one who showed them where to find carbohydrates. Trust it, trust it that a woman kept them fed, right? Also, it's a host plant for our zebra swallowtail butterfly, which is our state butterfly here in Tennessee. So we all should probably grow these in our garden, not to mention the beautiful yellow fall color and a very tropical plant. By the way, this is a tropical tree that decided it could make it in North America when the ice ages wiped out the other family, the other tropical trees in this family, Ananaceae. So it really is a North American tropical tree. And there is our spice bush swallowtail. I'm sorry, I got a little bit out of order with him. Um, and, no, I'm sorry, that's our pipe vine. That's our pipe vine because they got the spidery legs. So pipe vine is a very interesting plant, not only a great host plant for our, for our butterflies, for the pipe vine swallowtail, but really, really cool flowers. That's what looks like the Dutchman's pipe, and that's what gives the plant its name. But this flower structure, whenever you see a weird flower, go look it up. Go pollination of, you know, Aristolochia species, and you'll find some strange stories. So if you cut one open, you see what it's doing inside there. These downward facing hairs, uh, and these are pollinated by flies, a small fly. The fly enters and, and can't back up. Once it starts in, it's only allowed to go inside. And somehow, Celeste, I can't see all of my slides. Can we move, minimize the a little bit? I'm seeing so many pictures, I can't see a whole lot of my slide. I don't know if you can. Um, well, I, I can, and I think that's probably up to individuals, um, how they have their... 
Let me try right. this. I'll just do it. Now I got it. I got it. I fixed it. Okay. Okay. All right. So the flies are trapped in there. They can't leave. So they're banging around in there. They're pollinating that flower. <clears throat> and this flower is going to be female while that's going on. <clears throat> and then once it gets plenty of pollen and it's like, I'm pregnant enough. Okay. That's enough. Then the female parts of that flower stop being receptive and the male parts become active. And before they will release that fly, they dust that fly with plenty of pollen. So once that has happened, then those hairs, those guard hairs, we call them, will wither and they will allow that fly to exit. In fact, some of the Dutchman pipe flowers will sort of droop too to allow an easier exit strategy. So this flower is really kind of in control. And then I guess it must not be too bad an experience because the fly will go repeat it somewhere else. And there are the resulting swallowtail caterpillars. We usually have a lot of these. This is a particular Aristolochia fimbriata that grows as a little ground cover in our parking lot and does beautifully. <clears throat> While we're talking about some of our native swallowtails, have y'all ever noticed? We call it puddling, which looks pretty cute when they're doing it on a stream bank around a mud puddle. But often the uh, butterflies will also land on carrion or even dog feces. Um, and they are actually get, gathering up salt and minerals and nutrients that I, I thought at some point I had read were presented to the female to help her pr produce eggs. But it turns out that what it actually happens is it increases the male's potency, his virility and his pheromone abilities to attract the females. So that's pretty cool. I guess it makes him into a stinkier guy, which makes sense and which somehow helps attract the females. Odd. Another great little plant we run across, uh, of course, growing up, we called ours Maypop. People call it by different names as you go around the country, but our, our native passion flower, passion fruit. And you see the bee there, and he's going around getting the sweet stuff down there at the base of the corolla, and he's getting stroked on his back. Let's look at the structure of this flower a little more closely. Okay, so you see the little pads that are yellow with pollen, and as he went round and round down there, he was getting stroked with that pollen. Well, the female parts are sticking up in the air right now. And that means that it's probably morning. Because here's what this flower will do. It will keep the female parts kind of out of play for the early times of the day. And the bees are, are coming and visiting. And then they begin to lower and they get at the same level as those pads. Hopefully later on in the day, the bees that are arriving have been to other maypop vines around. And so the female parts will come into play simply by their change of position. So in other words, it acts as, acts as a male flower during parts of the day, acts as a female flower during parts of the day simply by its own movement. And there's another great word for us, flexistyle. <clears throat> this is something, this is one of those things that Charles Darwin figured out in his own garden. If, by the way, if you have never read Voyage of the Be Beagle, it's a fantastic adventure book. I highly recommend it. He then grew ill though and stayed home and most of his other investigations he did right in his own garden. And he wrote at least three books about how plants make babies that are really interesting. Okay, I drew a little pink arrow right there so you can see the, the womb, the fruit that becomes the maypop. So you see the female parts that are leading to it and they got pollinated and that begins to grow and that eventually ends up in your maypop. Here it is at the green stage. And of course this is also a host plant for our Gulf Fritillary butterfly. I leave a few around my garden even though it's awfully weedy. If you try to move it, it's like trying to put up a wildfire. They pop up everywhere. Luckily, I got a pretty big property here where I kind of allow some weedy areas. And there it is, our beautiful Gulf Fritillary butterfly. <clears throat> this particular, the yellow passion flower, the Passiflora lutea, its uh, style is so tall that it was hard for the little bees to get stroked. But it turns out that this is pollinated by one species of bee and the male bee will wait around and hope for females to show up. And when they get there and they start going round and round that big stylus to get some of the sweet stuff, he will mount her and it takes the pair of them mounted together reproducing to help this flower reproduce, which I thought was really cool. Uh, other things. Let me talk about, well, let's talk about the moon vine for just a minute. Um, some plants are pollinated by moths. We like to talk a lot about the butterflies and a lot of people do like to dislike moths and certainly this one's 
caterpillar does a lot of damage. It is our tomato hornworm. But for all of us who have enjoyed the moonflower opening up um, in the evening and the scent that it releases and the hummingbird sized moths that show up, uh, we sometimes will give them a tomato plant or two so that we can enjoy these, these beautiful moths in the evening. I like to tell a story. I don't know if Lauren's on listening to us or not, but Lauren, my niece decided to get married on the family farm in the lawn and it was gonna be a sunset wedding. And my brother and sister-in-law had the foresight to put a big old metal archway out there for the ceremony and plant moonvine on it. So the uh, sun is setting, we're gathered sitting on the lawn. My brother David is starting to play the piano and um, the bridesmaids are starting to go down the aisle and the moon vines begin to open. Oh, and by the way, just as that happened, a white V of cattle egret flew overhead, caught the last rays of the sun and just glowed. So the moon vines are opening, the fragrance is pouring out over the, the gathering of fa family and friends. The bridesmaids are coming down the aisle and I'll be darned, here come the hummingbird moths. So they are visiting the petals scattered down the aisle, the moonflowers over the bride and groom, even the bouquets of the bride and groom. And the person sitting next to me turned around and said, my gosh, how did y'all get hummingbirds to come to the wedding? And I just said, we're just that good. I mean, when we go to the ocean, the dolphins leap out of the water to greet us. But it was a beautiful moment. I think the bad thing was though, people paid a lot of attention to that and not so much to the bride and groom. But you might remember that if you ever want to do a sunset wedding. So just going out and paying attention, another moth I learned to love, and I hope we all do learn to love many of the moths because they're amazing creatures. I found this huge, huge cocoon and you see the huge hand there. I've got the giant hands as made famous on a Seinfeld show. And that turned out to be a cecropia moth, the giant silk moth. Uh, the cecropia moth, <clears throat> I was lucky enough to be there when he emerged. Um, and you see he's still kind of fat bodied right here and his wings have not fully expanded. And you can see by his big feathery antenna, he's a male. The males will find the females by the scent. And the kind of tragedy of these moths is that they only live about eight days and you cannot plant anything for them to feed on while they're in the winged state because they have no mouth. The only feeding they do is last year as a caterpillar. So they've got to find each other mate and the females got to lay eggs in just a little over a week span. Uh, so kind of sad, but very interesting and very beautiful creatures, the giant silk moths. And there's several of them that actually have this particular way of making babies. There it is as it fully expanded and I stuck it back out in the woods and hoped it would find a female and make some babies before it came to the end of its brief life. The caterpillars were stunning too though of the cecropia moth uh, and maybe life as a caterpillar is not that uninteresting. We like to think about the winged life as being the more beautiful and fun but munching around on a tree and being as colorful as a Chinese parade I think might be a lot of fun as well. So the, the caterpillar stage is not to be despised. Luna moths, same thing, like, same lifestyle. And I think everybody loves a Luna moth. So it's a great, I call this the um, entryway drug to moth loving uh, our Lunas because we often associate them with uh, big city lights. I mean, parking lights around the parking lot or at the baseball games. And guess what they feed on y'all? Sweet gum, the much despised sweet gum. Sweet gums are always hated for the little hairy balls, prickly balls. Um, and they can be an irritant when planted in the wrong place. But leave sweet gums where you can, where those little balls aren't going to be a problem. So you can uh, feed these big moths. That is where I found my cecropia moth cocoon was on a sweet gum tree. And if you look at their structures, they're really pretty cool and interesting. And the flowers are absolutely fascinating on a sweet gum. There's the female flower on the lower right. On the top left, you see both the female flower hanging down from the bottom and the male flower jutting up from above. So that makes sense, doesn't it? The pollen will sift down, sift down onto the female parts of that, that flower. All right, let's go into the honeybee sex life for just a little bit. <clears throat> this of course is a worker bee. All the worker bees are female. And just to get a look at the drones, the queen and the worker. And the queen is not the boss of anything. She's the slave basically to the hive. And it's amazing how these hives make decisions as a whole. 
And then I really got curious about honeybees. I was roaming around an old fallen in farmhouse out in the middle of nowhere and there was a um, swarm emerging from the steps. There was a hole broken in the steps and they had made a big colony in there. And I, as they left, I wondered how did they know which bee goes off with the old queen and which bee stays with the new queen. I mean, it's not like you count off one, two, one, two, one, two, and you once go with the old queen and you two stay with the new queen. This is pretty interesting. The drones now, of course, they do make a few drones, but what happens is when they decide to make a new queen, it's the worker bees that decide, you know what, we're getting pretty big. We need to make a new queen. Some of us need to get out of here and start a new colony somewhere. So they feed a lot of extra pollen and royal jelly and bee cake, pollen cake to a few larvae to make their queens. And they make more than one just to hedge their bets. And the queen bee, as she emerges, is the only one of the honeybees that has a smooth stinger. And that's because she's going to stab to death the other queens before they emerge from their cells. So that's a kind of a cruel thing, it seems like, but you don't need a whole lot of queens. I guess there's not enough workers to go around. So then she's going to take off. She's going to find a drone to mate with on her mating flight. Well, she doesn't want to mate with one of her drones, of course. That would be incestuous. She needs some new chromosomes. So there are males out there, drones, that form little overhead kind of um, moving, swarming in air places where females can come find them. The queens go out and they may mate with more than one male. Now males um, are going to make the ultimate sacrifice. When they hook up with the female, they're the, they're the workers taking care of their queen. They're just making her lay eggs, lay eggs, lay eggs. Oh, by the way, if she only gets out of the hive twice, that is for her, when she's a new queen, her mating flight, and then she is part of the swarm that leaves then she's the old queen that gets to kicked out, gets to get kicked out and moved to a new home, which may be the most exciting thing that ever happens to her after her mating flight. So I don't really feel bad for her on that. The swarms, again, they're so interesting. So the, the workers are protecting the queen while the scouts are out there trying to find a new home and just leave them alone, let them move on if you can um, and, and they will move on, don't bother them. So here on the top left, if you can see, this is one of those uh, places where the males hang out hoping to attract some queen bees to mate with. And you look now on the bottom left, there is the male mating parts of a drone. And you see it's a very interesting little structure with barbs on it. So if he does manage to hook up like he's doing on the upper right with the queen, it's going to be pretty bad when he pulls away because that part of him is staying and it rips out his innards and he does fall to the ground dead hopefully happy about getting to hook up, but uh, it's a pretty big sacrifice to make more babies. Let's hope it's called getting lucky. So with bumblebees, we have a whole different thing going on and we have a whole lot of, by the way, different kinds of bumblebees and I've really gotten interested in them lately. A lot of our native bees, which of course our honeybees are not, I love a honeybee, but our native bees can do some kinds of things, types of pollination that our native bee cannot. Here's a couple of books if you're interested in the subject. And by the way, on the left, you see red clover. Red clover can only be pollinated by honeybees. I mean, by bumblebees. So if you're somebody who's trying to produce red clover seed, you can't unless you have a very active population of bumblebees. So bumblebees are really important for certain flowers and honeybees cannot help them out. So good to know. You may know this little flower. If you wander around and look at things, especially this is going to be down in our wetlands uh, in late summer, it's Rexia, Rexia virginica. And you see those strange, strange uh, pollen structures, the anthers. So once again, I went and looked it up, thought this must have a really good story behind it. And it turns out that it does. <clears throat> this is a flower that requires a certain type of pollination that only our bumblebees can do, honeybees can't do, called buzz sonication. So, Buzz sonication is important for um, a lot of different plants, including tomatoes. Now, tomatoes, when they first started doing greenhouse production, it turned out they were not getting good fruit set in spite of the fact that tomato plants can self-pollinate. And they discovered that they had to imitate a bumblebee because a bumblebee can get on that flower and vibrate his wings. And you've probably heard this when you're out in the garden, you'll hear a a, a bee and a flower going doing all this crazy buzzing and he's trying to find the good vibration that will actually make that 
anther just explode pollen onto his little furry body. So tomatoes benefit from that. And when they discovered they needed to do that, this is actually what they were doing in the beginning is hiring workers to hold vibrators to the flower parts of tomatoes. Uh, that would be an interesting thing to have as your first job, which by the way, my first job was sexing boll weevils. It was, I kid you not. Bumblebees do a better job, and uh, now a lot of people will either use bumblebees in the greenhouse or they have bred tomatoes that don't require the buzz sonication so well. Look at the cool little seed pods, by the way, on our, on our Rexia. Aren't they gorgeous? Little urns. So there's our bumblebees. Now, I got reading about the genders of bumblebees, and this is interesting. The males of the bumblebees are, as you might expect, hairier. They often have hairier faces, hairier legs. And also, you'll notice that the male bumblebee does not have the little pollen bags on its legs. That's because the male bumblebees are not taking pollen back to feed the colony. Now, bumblebees usually nest underground. The queen bee overwinters as a single. Everybody else is dead. She lives underground for the winter. Then she starts laying some eggs and making some workers. And they all go out and start gathering pollen and raising more workers. One of those will eventually be the queen. They do make a few male bees to use for uh, mating, um, but the male bees don't carry pollen back to the nest. So they don't need the little saddle bags. And they will at, go out and drink nectar, but they're not really concerned with pollen. So a lot of times, you know, you've all in the morning been out early and you found a bumblebee on a flower, kind of chilled and dewy, where it fell asleep working the flower. And a lot of times before the, they won't wake up until the sun warms them up a little bit. Start checking and you may notice that a lot of times that's your male bumblebee because he's not allowed to come back and get back into the colony in the evening like the females are. There's a whole lot of, um, I call it deadbeat dadism going on in the uh, animal and plant world. Uh, not all, but some. If you want to know more, this was a very good site that is not on your handout, by the way. By the way, Celeste uh, did, does provide a handout and on there, I put a whole lot of my favorite Facebook pages, websites, and then also a list of some of my very favorite books. Of course, it's just a starter list. There's just always gonna be more and more and more. And I'd be very pleased, by the way, if some of you would send me some of your favorite sites and books, because I'm always looking for a good read. Um, not to know not to know out about this. A butter, uh, excuse me, bumblebees are also very good pollinators of our native blueberries. <clears throat> Somebody sent me this when they knew I was doing the sex in the garden talk, so I had to add this, the orgasmic blue blueberries uh, tag that they saw somewhere at the grocery store. Let's get into the sex life of some of the animals who've gotten into the, the plants, and I'm gonna run out of time here if I don't hurry. Toads, the, the songs of frogs and toads. I love an American toad's long, beautiful trill hanging in the spring air. However, the toad's sex life, sex life is pretty ugly. If a female toad approaches, um, there are what they call satellite toads that aren't as good as singers. And they can mob that female toad in the water. And if the water is deep, they could form a mating ball that keeps her underwater too long and she can actually drown. Now that's much more polite with the bullfrogs. With bullfrogs, they very much respect each other, other's territory. Um, one bullfrog is control over a whole lot of the shoreline on a pond and the female will approach that very sexy male singer, and then they will swim together to a part of the pond where he simply holds her in his arms, and then he releases um, his sperm and where she is laying her eggs, just they mingle just as they both admit all that. So it's sort of like getting pregnant in the swimming pool kind of thing. There's no actual um, connection between their parts, but pretty cool that they, uh, they're more respectful and sweet to each other than the toads. By the way, bullfrog tadpoles are huge. I have bullfrog tadpoles in my pool. I'm hoping to see a whole lot of them get out there and wrestle over the territory this summer because this will be their second year. Bullfrog tadpoles can take two, up to five years to become frogs. They're really big, crazy looking tadpoles, two to five years. There's another type of interesting toad called the spadefoot toad, and it only become, comes above ground when we have huge rains. I mean, like five, seven inch rains. The rest of its life, it lives underground, never comes above ground, unless we have big, big puddles, at which point 
y'all forgive the canine outburst. I knew this was going to happen at some point. It will come above ground and they will have what it's called orgy breeding. And they all just pile in together. There's a whole hey, Chiba, no. There's a whole bunch of baby making going on real quick. Hey, and the tadpoles develop very quickly to take advantage of the I'm gonna throw something at you. Take take advantage of those ephemeral pools, they call them. So um I'm going to play a song here in just a minute because the uh, spade foot has got the coolest sound. So this is a great page. Y'all are going to really enjoy this. I'm going to go there live. Hopefully we can get back to my program easily. I had a little bit of trouble with it earlier. Well, let me go down here. This is Leaps. This is the Frogs and Toads of Tennessee. And you can play all the different sounds. And you'll find you probably have a whole lot more different frogs and toads than you know around your house. I've identified 11 different species here simply by listening to the songs and not realizing that what I was listening to was actually a frog or a toad. So I'm going to play the call of the Eastern Spadefoot. It had been a huge rain. I went out one evening and this is what I heard. Isn't that crazy? Wow. Now I've got to get back to it somehow. Really, really cool. A uh, real quick thing about skinks, just mama skinks, I want y'all to know they will lay all their eggs together in a little colony and they help look out for each other. If one's got to go get something to eat or something to drink, they babysit each other's eggs. I love the, the this insect world and the wasps part of it, I think get despised a lot. But a lot of times they are very good predators in our garden. And I'm especially fond of the cicada wasp, this enormous wasp. It's actually very friendly and not dangerous at all. Um, and they take these insects home, they will sting that thing with a paralyzing sting. They carry it to their burrow and lay an egg just above a wing, and then um, they lay their eggs on it for their hatching larvae to eat. It's very interesting to know that these wasps know whether the egg they've laid is a female egg or a male egg. The female eggs, the female larvae get three locusts each, or cicadas, rather, and the males only get one because the females are the larger working part of the, of the operations. They can't fly very far carrying these cicadas, so they'll climb up to the top of a fence post or up a sapling. And they throw themselves off and fly as far as they can until they hit the ground again. Then they'll drag the cicada along until they find another something to climb, and then then throw themselves off again over and over until they finally get to their burrow. They look fierce and terrible, but they're actually very friendly. The female does have a small stinger. She doesn't want to use it on you. She's saving her paralyzing fluid for those cicadas. And there you see some of the enormous holes that they will dig. Apparently their sounds are a real problem on golf courses. They like the sandy soil often you'll find on golf green. So in some places they are actually considered a pest, but a fantastic insect. Our little dirt daubers, again, here's the female. On the right, she's carrying her little mud ball, mud daubers, and she's carrying it to build her nest. The male will kind of guard the nest and be helpful, but it's the female doing all the work. And then she stings spiders, and she will pack those dirt dauber nests full of little paralyzed spiders for her young to eat as they hatch out. So if you've ever broken one open, you see these spiders, they're not dead, they're like zombies. They're moving in slow motion um, really creepy but cool. Study the uh, nest on the far left and you'll see all the different colors of mud and that's because there was different mud puddles at different times. You know there might be some mud puddles available up close one day and then that one dries up and she had to travel to a different mud puddle to get her building material on a different day. So often you'll see all these different colors um, in one nest because she had to travel around and find some workable mud. Dragonflies have some really wild sex lives. By the way, if they're pointing their tail up like that, it has nothing to do with mating. They're pointing it at the sun. And it's called the obelisk position. And that is so they minimizes the amount of sunlight striking the that dragonfly's body. So they do it when they get hot, basically, to minimize the amount of sunlight hitting their bodies. Now, dragonfly sex the males are very adamant about that female being their female and nobody else is allowed to impregnate her. 
So it might look pretty cool. You see on the far left, a little heart shape that they make while they're mating. Looks like love, right? But if you follow his tail, he's the one in the front. He's got her gripped right behind her head. He's got her by the neck and he is not letting go. And he forces her to put her parts up to his parts until they mate. So that's what makes the heart shape that you're seeing. Now that still doesn't mean he's gonna let her go once they've successfully mated. He wants to make sure she's gonna lay his eggs. So then he goes and carries her over a body of water and he's still holding her by the neck and he's dipping her tail over and over into the water to lay his eggs and his eggs only. Now I've seen some stupid male dragonflies banging a female against the hood of a shiny blue car because apparently it looked like water to him. So sex life with the dragonflies can be pretty brutal. Pretty cool plant, pretty beautiful though, aren't they? The dragonfly nymphs are pretty great creatures. If you've ever sained up ditches, muddy ditches and looked at them down there, they're fierce. They're actually some of your better mosquito predators, much better than um, let's say our swallows that we love so much. <clears throat> they will eat both the larva, they will eat small minnows. The uh, adult dragonflies are also great mosquito uh, predators. So let's just review, plant a whole bunch of different stuff when you want good wildlife gardens. Um, Multi-purpose plants, plants that are beautiful, that provide cover, flowers for nectar and pollen, that have both edible foliage and pretty flowers, fruit, berries, acorns, and then of course beauty for us too. We love beauty. I know I'm running out of time. I'm gonna wind it up. I'm a huge fan of E.O. Wilson. Um, this is another example of somebody who really got interested in nature. He was an Alabamian just running through the fields looking at things. He poked out um, an eye, he poked, well he ruined the vision actually with a fish fin when he was fishing as a small boy. So he began to study little things he could see up close and that's why he became an expert on ants. And then his thinking on ants transferred to larger, larger creatures in the ecosystems and he's one of the most brilliant people I've ever read. Uh, E.O. Wilson calls them the little creatures who run the world. And I think there are valuable lessons for all of us to be learned from that. Um, and going back to valuable lessons learned, my mother uh, always turned her back when I was taking her picture when we were traveling. We often stopped at botanical gardens. Here I was at the J.C. Ralston many years ago in the Campus Grandiflora Morning Calm. She didn't want me to take her picture. I don't know why, because look at that beautiful, beautiful woman. My parents as high schoolers in Tupelo, Mississippi, and on their last trip to New Zealand. But these are the people who, you know, brought us up on a farm and my mother who turned me loose out in the woods and my mother who taught me to uh, inform myself about the natural world and to explore without fear once I found out how to get home and, you know, which snakes to be cautious around. I, th I think the lesson here, you know, is to help teach our young ones not to be afraid of the world, to explore it. This is a great time right now with everything that's going on. You know, we're not in control of very much that's going on out there around us in the bigger and the global and the national sense right now. But what we can do is go outside and take care of the small things. Um, I have to conclude with the one story, but I love starting, butterflies, I call them a, a gateway a insect. You can convince somebody then to hold a bee on their finger and learn to trust them and learn their proper roles. I notice again, the girl here was a little braver than the guy. I want to tell a story about my mother and uh, spiders. I had written a column about spiders and was telling my mother about it. And she said, um, you know, honey, I've always loved spiders and your older brothers spent many happy little boy hours catching grasshoppers and throwing them into the web of the garden spider down where you were born in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And she said, and one day a man knocked on the door and handed me my cleaning and said, and by the way, lady, I killed that big yellow spider for you. And what was so funny is I could hear the grief in her voice for a spider that had been dead 50 something years. Because she did care. She did care about the little things. Um, one day I'm walking up the barn driveway and they had built a little retirement home on the farm and I can see my mother bowing, bowing to a lawn chair and then bowing to a shrub off the porch. And I got up closer to her and I said, have you got some kind of new religion? She said, no, look. And she was extending a leaf to a tiny praying mantis. They were hatching out of an Uthaka the praying mantis egg case on the back of a lawn chair. And it would grip the leaf and then she would take it over to the edge of the porch and put each one on its own shrub because she had read somewhere 
that they might eat each other if they couldn't find something to eat right away. And I thought, wow. I said, Mama, look at your priorities. No wonder this old farm never made any money. But I love the fact that she left me a greater legacy than money, right? She taught me to respect the wild things and to get a great deal out of uh, taking care of them. So I hope we all do that. That's who I am. I'll be glad to answer questions. I know I ran exactly an hour and I hurried a good bit and tried to cover too much, as is my great fault as a speaker. Celeste, I'm sorry. No, you did great. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. So we're having, we've been having a lot of uh, questions in the chat box about the your handout, and I have, I have shared the word document at least three times, and I just shared it again. So, but I'm still having people saying that no, they they aren't seeing it. So, if mm. I'm seeing, I'm not really sure why because I, I mean I can see it and I can click on it and it opens up the Word document, um, but uh, that's okay because we have it on our website, the Master Madison County Master Gardener website. So let me share that address with you. I will put it in the chat box. And most of you are friends with me. You can just ask me for it directly and I'll send it to you. And I also want to congratulate all of you. Um, I always know that I'm talking to like-minded people. Gardeners are out there taking care of all these little creatures. Uh, and it makes me really feel like I'm part of a big community. And these days, that's kind of important to us, isn't it? So I want to express my personal gratitude, really, to every one of you. So I'm going to steal the, the screen sharing for just a second. And so now I hope everybody can see the Madison County Master Gardener website. And I shared the address there in the chat box for everyone. And if you uh, scroll down on the home page, you'll see right here on the right, um, we have the schedule for all of the upcoming art and garden lectures. And then right beside that, we have the links to each of uh, the handouts that go along with those talks. So that can be an easy resource for you to find in the future. I'd like to thank Carol for being here with us today and sharing all that wonderful information. And um, to also to introduce myself, my name is Celeste Scott, and I'm the Horticulture Extension Agent for Madison County. So if you ever have any issues with horticulture, feel free to give me a call. My number is 731-225-1057. You can also reach me at cscott52 at utk.edu, and we hope to see you at future art and garden um, lecture series. Have a good day.